So I will be talking about the drivers of violent extremism, as well as pathways out of violent extremist groups in Africa. But as I'm sure most of you are aware of, this is a very big topic. In fact, it can be the subject of an entire seminar on its own. So what I'm going to present here, I don't intend for it to be the definitive or final or complete picture of violent extremism on the African continent today, but to be a conversation starter that we can get into when we're in our discussion groups and have a bit more of a conversation about what is driving violent extremism and what are the pathways out. So when we're thinking about violent extremist activity on the African continent today, it's clear that the African continent is increasingly becoming the epicenter of violent extremist activity in the world. Whereas we've seen a general decline in violent extremist activities and fatalities linked to those groups in areas in other parts of the world over the past five to six years, on the African continent we've seen a noticeable uptick in activities. In fact, over 2023, fatalities linked to violent extremist groups uh, rose by 20% from the previous year of 2022. So this represented a near doubling in fatalities linked to such groups since 2021. Data from ACLED also reveals that violent extremist groups have claimed more than 23,000 deaths, uh, lives, uh, as a result of the activities over 2023. And this is a significant increase from the roughly 19,400 deaths and fatalities that were reported in 2022. Now, as you can see from the graph here, the majority of these fatalities are concentrated in Somalia and in the Sahel. Combined, these regions account for 80% of the fatalities that we see across the entire continent. And though the Sahel and Somalia do account for the majority of the deaths we see, this is followed by the Lake Chad Basin that we see that though the, the region has generally seen a plateauing of deaths and fatalities linked to violent extremist groups in that region, in the last year we've seen a slight uptick in activities by these groups and the fatalities linked to their violent events. In northern Mozambique, on the other hand, Though no violent extremist activities and fatalities linked to those activities have been on the decline over 2023, when you look at the first half of this year, we see that there's been a noticeable increase in their activities, suggesting that there could be a resurgence and remobilization of activities linked to the Al-Shabaab group operating northern Mozambique. The other territory that we have on the chart here is North Africa that has seen a steady decline in violent extremist activities over the years. So when we're examining the continent and the groups that are responsible for these fatalities that we see on the continent, we see that most of these groups have allegiances or have pledged uh, allegiance to groups such as Al-Qaeda Al as well as the Islamic State. But when we zoom into those two regions accounting for 80% of the deaths that we see on the continent today, so the Sahel and Somalia, what we see is that the groups that have been mainly responsible for majority of these activities and fatalities linked to these activities have been those aligned with Al-Qaeda. So we think about the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb linked groups like JNIM operating in the Sahel, or we think of groups such as Al-Shabaab in Somalia. But this does not mean that we should not be concerned about Islamic State, whether it's Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, Islamic State in Somalia, or the groups linked to Islamic State operating in northern Mozambique where we're seeing a resurgence. And so what has the response been? When we look across the continent, the response still predominantly remains focused on militarized solutions. There's been an increase in array of multi-country military coalitions set up to conduct counter-terror operations, which have yet to deliver a decisive blow against these groups. So to best understand what strategies are most effective for countering these threats, and it is necessary for us to first understand what drives and sustains these groups. A starting point for any discussion about drivers of violent extremism on the African continent today is an understanding of definitions. Now, ambiguities exist around how we define both violent extremism and how we define radicalization. But 
if we think at the most basic level, radicalization is simply described as a process whereby people become extremists. So it's a process of adopting extremist belief systems and willingness to use support or facilitate violence as a method of social change. Where the ambiguity lies within that specific definition is this term of extremism. If we understand radicalization is a process of adopting extreme views, what then is extremism? How can we define that? And so here's where we need to understand that a distinction needs to be made between cognitive extremism and behavioral extremism. Cognitive extremism refers to this process of adopting ideas, often political, that are diametrically opposed to society's core values. On the other hand, behavioral extremism refers to methods, behaviors, actions, often which are violent, by which individuals seek to realize their aims. So some suggest that an extremist mindset is a precondition for you to be able to engage in extremist behaviors. So put differently, you first have to be cognitively extreme, have adopt extreme viewpoints, and only then will you then choose to go on and adopt and take on uh, behaviors that involve using violence to achieve these extremist aims. But when we really invest, investigate this empirically, we notice that cognitive extremism is just one of many pathways into extremist actions. So not all terrorists are motivated by extreme ideas. So being a cognitive extremist, in other words, is not a necessary or a sufficient uh, condition for you to be a terrorist. In fact, many terrorists who lay claim to having a conviction towards a certain cause can very rarely articulate in a very well put form what those ideas and ideologies are. And on the flip side, we also have a lot of folks who do have uh, extreme viewpoints, extreme belief systems, who never go out and do anything about it, will never pick up a gun and go and do something about it or choose to support financially groups that want to go uh, further and commit uh, terrorist violence. So if we acknowledge that adopting radical views or radical ideology is just one but not the only pathway to engage in extremist uh, terrorist violence, how else can we assess and determine other pathways towards ex uh, terrorist violence? So I argue that you can do so by looking at the structural, group, and individual level factors that drive violent extremism on the continent. By looking at these three factors, we can be able to understand what is really driving the motivations of those who are engaging in this violence, if we understand that ideology is not the only or main driver. So let's start with structural factors. And here I'm just talking about those broader structural dynamics within a country or within a region that can create the conditions necessary for violent extremist groups to take advantage, to recruit, operate, as well as expand their influence. And so dynamics such as having dysfunctional governance, limited statehood, uh, historic political or socioeconomic marginalization of communities at the periphery, state repression and corruption, low trust and confidence in the state amongst the public, and living in deeply divided societies with long-standing hostilities between identity groups create the conditions rife for violent extremists to be able to manipulate and take advantage of the situation. Two useful examples. If you look at Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb operating in northern Mali in the 90s, what really helped the group was taking advantage of the fact that there was a limited state presence and limited governance in the areas of northern Mali that allowed the group to be, the group AQIM as well as its predecessors, to be able to operate in the northern territories of uh, North Africa and also take advantage of the lack of governance in the area in the north, northern Mali to be able to successfully conduct its activities and operate. And further on, the Libya crisis we saw in 2011 and 2012 also created further opportunities to recruit. The same is the case for Somalia, where we see in the 90s 
with the breakdown of governance and state failure, creating these opportunities for various different extremist groups to emerge, and some later on coalescing into al-Shabaab. The next thing you need to consider is group level factors. And here I argue that insights can be drawn from the founders and successes of violent extremist organization. And the reason why is because these individuals tend to set the tone around why the group exists, explaining and justifying its causes and drivers. And they also tend to set the tone in how the group achieves its goals via the tactics and resources that it uses. So let's think about two notable examples again. Let's use AQIM and Al-Shabaab again. If we think about Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, what we notice is that for the most part, despite some variations, the group's why has largely remained similar. They still want to expand the global caliphate, they want to expel foreign troops, they want to implement Sharia, and they want to govern territory. An interesting thing happened uh, last year where we saw one of the uh, leaders, Abu Ubaidah al-Anabi, claim in an interview with the journalist Wasim Nasser, saying that the group's disputes with France were limited to local issues in the Sahel and wider Africa, and he went on to criticize Western leaders for failing to acknowledge that AQIM's interests are exclusively in Africa, suggesting this domesticated vision of where they see the group's focus. So in, uh, in terms of the how, it's important to consider the expanded influ how they have expanded their influence southwards. And here's where, if you think about works done by individuals such as Caleb Wise, they end up articulating five tactics that the groups have used to be able to achieve its goals. And the first tactic when they were expanding their influence southwards into the Sahel was to befriend or create local, uh, no, sorry, befriend or create militant groups operating in the midst of conflict, integrate themselves into communities where those militants exist, and exploit grievances of those communities to gain sympathy and address internal and external dissent either passively or aggressively and looking towards new theaters once their base was solidified. So there was this effort to be able to lo recruit locally. And we see very similar uh, dynamics when we look at al-Shabaab. They have very similar whys of expanding the caliphate, governing, expelling foreign troops, but when you think about how they go about it, they have a clear clan engagement strategy that involves being able to tap into local clan dynamics and be able to recruit lo locally. And they do this to be able to legitimize their activities, especially in terms of how they govern. So when you think about group level factors, it seems that how the groups are organizing their hows is being able to uh, ensure that they're gaining local recruits and taking advantage of local grievances. The last factor we must consider are individual factors. We must talk, think about uh, those who are part and current members of extremist groups. We must talk to those who are recently defected from these groups. And we must speak to those who are detainees. And this is how we can be able to get insights from how they feel about how they were able to come into the group and what are the process for them to get out of the groups. Um, as you can see, there's been a lot of studies conducted that have actually directly talked to these three subset of individuals. And uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'll ask you to go to the next slide. We can see that there was a study done by the UNDP in 2017 and 2023 that interviewed individuals that were either defectors, detainees, or current members across Sub-Saharan Africa. And they found a few uh, notable things. One, that recruitment was mostly local, and it was through peers and family members. And they also acknowledged that push and pull factors uh, played a big role in terms of how folks came in. One of the main drivers for them, uh, for individuals choosing to join violent extremist groups, tended to be an isolation or feeling a sense of remote, remoteness or a lack of exposure to others this need to find a sense of belonging because of feeling historically underrepresented, uh, hope for employment being a main primary driver, and a strong lack of trust in the government and security sector. 
in fact, a specific trigger event for pushing individuals from being at risk to recruitment into them actually joining violent extremist groups was, luckily, was mostly government action, <laughs> or the government conducting human rights abuses or killing or arresting family members. One thing that the study really found after talking to all these individuals was that religion or ideology was not the main factor explaining recruitment. This desire for all these other factors, the lack of uh, having a sense of community, this need for employment, and this general resentment or feeling of marginalization really were the main drivers. So this has spurned a lot of conversation about what uh, uh, the things, what, what other factors can the government use to help to s encourage people to defect more easily? And a recent study came out in December of last year, mostly focused on Somalia, and they found very interesting findings. One of the findings they found is that the ongoing offensive military operations against the group actually did have an impact in encouraging people to, uh, to leave the, the uh, al-Shabaab but not for me the reasons that you're thinking. One of the m motivations to escape was fear, fear of drone strikes. But another was that the offensive created opportunities to flee. Al-Shabaab was too scattered and trying to fight off the offensive that they weren't necessarily focused so much on individuals and holding them back in. This also say that you know, the offensive also created more opportunity for potential defectors to have more contact with security forces, because security forces were going out into the hinterlands. So there was more proximity to government units to be able to defect to them. Other factors have to do with communication and communicating effectively. Uh, you, communication needs to be through family members that works very importantly, and this is important for us to consider how to leverage local communities to help people be able to defect. Also focused a lot on political leaders being uh, willing enough to actually say that they will have amnesty when uh, folks are able to defect. And also using former Al-Shabaab members to be able to send this messaging. All of that matters. To conclude, we see that there are structural, group, and individual level factors that matter for determining why people can be driven into violent extremist groups. And we can talk a lot about the different ways to be able to counter these groups, but I want to talk a little bit more about prevention. I think understanding why people go into these groups gives us a bit more of an understanding on how to prevent them from being at risk or prevent those trigger points that actually tip people into actually choosing to join these groups. And so this way I want to leave it is a question to you all is how can we be more focused around preventative uh, approaches to countering violent extremism? Thank you.